Coming up in this weekend, computer hardware, DX12, multi-GPU performance, AMD wins. Is your motherboard ready for Cobby Lake? MacBook Pro reviews are trickling out. And just what is PowerColor's Devil Box? All that more coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C A G F L Y dot com. This is Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 388, recorded November 3rd, 2016. Cobby Lake upgrades are here, people. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Grasshopper. Stay connected and run your business from your mobile phone with Grasshopper. To save $50 on your order, visit trygrasshopper.com slash twit. Welcome to Twitch, this weekend computer hardware, Twitch weekly show. The name is to bring you the most useful, most informative, most engaging, most delightful, and most superfluous. No, actually, it's the most necessary and awesome hardware news for PC, mobile, gaming, console, and occasionally maker enthusiasts. We are full of joy today because Ryan, ladies and gentlemen, is not pulling things in and out of a moving van, and I am not under a deep panic about a potential hack of my computer. We'll get into that a little bit later. Are, are you moved? The set is built, or I'm assuming you're, you're actually in the new location and you moved the set, or you're actually in the old location and the set is still there, Ryan. See, that's the mystery, right, is that uh, you don't know where we're at because it looks identical. Uh, we're, in the new, we're in the new place. The set has moved. Uh, we did all the physical labor on Sunday and Monday of moving, but now the mental anguish of like unpacking and finding everything again and then trying to put stuff in some kind of organizational pattern that makes sense has has begun. And then also lots of pending deadlines on, oh, this content was due then, you know, you promised somebody this at that point, you know, two weeks ago when you started packing up and organizing things. So uh, a little bit at a time here and there making network cables, running them through ceilings, running cables across the floor until we can get electrical outlets in the, installed above the, uh, above the drop ceiling, things like that. Wonderful, wonderful things involved with uh, uh, moving into a new location. So you're feeling good. Yeah, I, I, we're, it's fine. It's fine. I, th I would say overall it went better than I thought in terms of like, we haven't found anything yet that was broken in the move. Um, the internet has been very reliable. The uh, computers, like my computer worked, the editing computer worked, like the, the streaming computer we're using for this works. Like everything seems to be functioning. It's just a matter of like, where the hell do we put lights in the new studio? Uh, because we have a much larger space now and lights can be farther away, but are they too far away because the lumen output isn't bright enough? So do we need to bring them in? And there's, you know, kind of reconfiguring of stuff at this point. The reconfiguring a ring a ring. Yeah. This is exciting. I'm excited that you're moved or mostly moved or semi-moved or kind of moved. I mean, we're, we're moved. We're just not okay. set up all the way. <laughs> you're in the neighborhood. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my goodness. Am I the only person that's upset about having to log in uh, to the GeForce experience? <laughs> no. These days? So uh, what, what were you trying to do in GeForce Experience, just out of curiosity? Oh, I just, you know, it was time to update. I opened up GeForce Experience. I'd gotten a new game. I was going to get everything configured to get my superlative gaming experience powered by NVIDIA GTX and GeForce Experience. And then it was like, yeah, you need a password. And I was like, huh, I need a password. I need an account. Yeah. I just you, find you have it, to have an account. It's funny know. because this is something they promised, I think it was last December. Uh, that they said, you know, we're going to require a login, but don't worry, we're going to have like contests and giveaways to make up for any any potential uh, headaches this may cause. Um, and they got a lot of negative feedback from it. And so they kind of kept pushing it and pushing it and pushing it. And I think what the what the what we knew then was that they were going to lock the beta drivers, the kind of game ready day one. Anything that wasn't a Wickel certified driver right. would be kind of locked behind GeForce Experience and having to have a login. Um, but it, it also looks like, you're, like you're saying, that it's they also locked out the um, the ability to like set up settings. 
in it, yeah. like to be able to one button hit and kind of configure your games for your hardware behind a login. And that, it sucks. Like I, like you understand why they're doing it. They want to have a, uh, an addressable database of their consumers. They want to be able to send you stuff and they want to be able to uh, know how many people are doing what. And, and, you know, like if you have one login at 10 systems, they can know, you know, they, they can get some interesting user metrics out of it, but it doesn't make it any less of a pain in the ass for the consumer, really. Um, but if all you need is drivers, you can still go to GeForce.com and download the Wickle drivers uh, from their website. You don't, have, you don't even have to install GFE necessarily to do that. But if you want to take advantage of, like, Shadow Play and the streaming capability and, yeah, the auto set uh, of settings and stuff, you, you will have to have a login. And I, I, I understand the desire to have less logins and not more across the internet. But, uh, just so yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> so did, did you get an account? Did it work? And did you then use the settings or? Oh, yeah. It's just, you know, and of course I immediately, I, I you know, it, because it's not in a window, it's not easy to put in my password manager. And, oh, uh, right. It's not like a browser type of thing. Right. Yeah. That's true. But, That's true. You know, it's just really, really, guys. <laughs> Trust me, they have heard that feedback many, many times. You know, uh, we hadn't talked about it. Like, I, apparently, I just needed to whine publicly about this. So it's fair. It's totally fair to do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my apologies. In any case, oh my goodness, um, not a huge week in hardware news this week, which is kind of a pleasure. Um, but you got some chance to take a look at DX12 uh, and multi-GPU performance, which I think is getting interesting, especially now that really amazing monitors are getting more affordable. Um, or should, when I say amazing, I mean high-resolution monitors, to be more accurate. Right. What, uh, what happened with Deus Ex? I mean, that was kind of the core of this, wasn't it? Yeah. So uh, the, what, what was interesting was in... Uh, so DX12 games have been kind of coming out at a, at a quicker pace, uh, or the DX12 paths have been kind of like patched in. Um, one of the things that, that changes dramatically with, with DirectX 12 was multi-GPU. So like SLI and Crossfire aren't really things anymore. Um, well, aren't necessarily things anymore. There's the chance that it they may still support that type of stuff. But it's more on the game developer now to kind of implement a multi-GPU uh, experience for consumers. Um, Deus Ex released a patch last week that added DirectX 12 into the mainline uh, path and also added multi-GPU support into the game. Um, and, and so I thought, okay, let's see how this works, right? We had seen uh, Ashes of the Singularity, but nothing from, from really anybody else at this point. And as you can see here, I just did a quick test with the RX 480 and the GTX 1060. Um, and the RX 480 scales very well at 1080p and 2560 by 1440, but the 1060 doesn't scale at all. Um, and that is not because the GTX 1060 doesn't support SLI because it, it does not technically support SLI technology. It doesn't have a place to put an SLI bridge. But that shouldn't affect the ability for a game to um, address and utilize two GPUs that exist in right. the same system, right? But clearly they, they are not able to, on the NVIDIA side of things, with the current driver setup, uh, but they are on the AMD side. So, um, you know, AMD's talked a lot about that they value multi-GPU with DX12. You know, uh, when the, the VP of, of the Radeon Technologies Group was here and did an interview, he talked about that being an important part of what they were going to do in the future. And in, in NVIDIA's side, they were very much like, well, you know, we're, we're going to support it, but, you know, they didn't seem to have as much emphasis uh, behind the scenes on multi-GPU support moving forward, right? They de-emphasized more than two GPUs, uh, only only available like on benchmarks and stuff like that. Um, mm -hmm. And it kind of, you know, this kind of result kind of shows the, the result of that. It kind of plays out like, okay, you actually get an advantage if you have a second RX 480 in this game, uh, whereas if you have a second 1060, you do not. And... Um, there's probably not a whole lot of people that have two of each of these cards because they, they're kind of budget-minded. But, um, you know, like if the, the, the 2560 by 1440 graph, which isn't actually on this page, but it actually takes one GPU is like 33 frames per second, two GPUs mm -hmm. goes to like 66. So you're fundamentally changing the experience 
of the game, right? You're going from a 30 FPS right. to a 60 FPS average frame rate, which is a, a pretty big difference, right? So um, there are there are still places where multi-GPU makes sense. And in, in, in if you look at the frame time graphs, we don't show any significant uh, frame time variance or stutter from the implementation that uh, uh, the IDOS team has done in, in Deus Ex Mankind Divided. So those were all really positive things. And it sucks that NVIDIA hasn't enabled it yet um, for whatever reason. It's probably just that they haven't done the debugging that they want to do type of thing. Uh, mm -hmm. But that doesn't that doesn't change if for people who are playing the game today or want to play the game today, maybe they have two 1070s or two 1080s, you're still going to have the same non-scaling result uh, with Deus Ex. So there's other games that are coming out uh, that have DX12 multi-GPU support. So I'm going to take a look at a couple of more in the next week or two. I think there's a Serious Sam VR early access game that I think is, is, is a even extra interesting example to look at because it's DX12. It's multi-GPU and it's VR, right? So, like, does right. does that fundamentally change how good of a VR experience it is for you being able to use multi-GPU versus not being able to use multi-GPU? So, uh, we'll we'll take a look at that in the uh, hopefully tomorrow or Monday timeframe. So, should be cool. Exciting. Yeah, a little disappointing with the 1060, but given that I'm still running a 950, um, <laughs> <laughs> I can I can wait. Yeah. Uh, some uh, GTX 1070s could use a vBIOS update, and uh, uh, Scott Michel wrote this up over at PC Per. Uh, video RAM chips are purchased from, from a variety of vendors. They should really be ideally interchangeable. Turns out while NVIDIA seems to ship their cards with Samsung memory, some partners have switched to Micron GDDR5 modules. And uh, the original vBIOS installed in graphics cards cannot provide enough voltage for Micron quick enough, so it would improperly store data. Um, so there are updated vBIOS is coming out. Digital Trends, Scott writes, listed EVGA, Gainward, and Pallet. But progress has been made since then. Uh, updates are up at Asus. Those came a couple days ago, uh, which claim to fix Micron memory stability. Uh, but it looks like Gigabyte and MSI, Scott writes, are still missing in action. And uh, <clears throat> he says, run GPUC if Micron produces your GDDR, GDDR5 on your uh, GPU uh, the GTX 1070, you need to start looking for a vBIOS update for that to make things more better and smooth and delightful. Yes. Yeah. Oh, man. This cool was this. news to me. So uh, I had, I don't, yeah. I, as far as I know, I don't have any 1070s that have the new memory vendor on them yet. And kind of from what I've been able to email people back and forth, like buying them at Newegg or Amazon or Best Buy. You're just kind of randomly getting one or not, so I uh, haven't had a chance yet to test it. Uh, but trying trying to get a hold of one of those to test before all of them ship with the new with the new BIOS is if only because I'm interested to see what the effect actually was. And if you even notice it, right? Oh my goodness. Um, GPU coolers. We've had a wave of liquid coolers coming out on uh, for CPUs uh, in the last couple of months. We've talked about those pretty regularly. Um, very interesting looking uh, liquid GPU cooler from uh, Ice Wolf. Uh, the AIO GPU cooler is for GTX 1070 and 1080 graphics cards. It's a water block that has a removable copper water block with a large aluminum fin stack. Uh, Tim Very wrote this up at PC Per. Um, so basically, some of the heat, uh, basically, the fin stack passively cools the memory chips and the VRM hardware. Feeds some of that heat into the copper block, which feeds it into the water loop, which pulls the heat out to the radiator, which then, of course, uh, blows it out through the back of the case with your fan or the top of the case. Um, so it's uh, it basically it's completely assembled, 120-millimeter uh, radiator with two fans and a push-pull configuration, uh, quick disconnects on both tubes. Um, loop is all copper except for the brass fittings. So the and the whole point of the the quick disconnects is is so you don't have to like struggle and fight and battle uh, if you you know <laughs> need to remove your GPU from your system, I don't know to clean it or to swap it or to uh, 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 you know uh, expand the loop to additional devices or additional uh, coolers, which I thought was pretty cool. Uh, 150 euros was about 164 dollars US for the 120 kit and the Pro, which is the cooler itself. Costing another one hundred and thirty-one dollars, not cheap 
uh, but a very, very nice system. And I, I should point out, I, I said earlier that it was it was a, a, a closed loop system. You do have the ability to open that up and reconfigure it uh, and change things around inside your system. Um, pretty cool. Not yeah. sure it's available yet in the U.S., but uh, I just thought it looked so neat. <laughs> and, you know, it's just, and it's there's no LED lights on it, which made me incredibly happy. So... <laughs> Sorry, we've had a lot of LED. Like, it was the LED memory that kind of put me over the edge. Uh, MSI and Asus follow Gigabyte uh, in offering Copy Lake compatible BIOS updates for the Z170, H170, B150, and H110 series motherboards. Um, you know, did I miss something? Did, did, did Copy Lake processors suddenly become available in volume? Or <laughs> No, no, they haven't. Okay. But yet everybody supports them now, essentially. Good. Um, and it, so and right I'll, I'll be honest with you. Yes. Like, yeah, I, I, we have to assume that's what it is. Um, it's still odd to get, it's odd, but welcome to get support for yeah, these before. processors integrated this <laughs> early, right? Yeah. Um, and, and so if you have one of these boards, and it also allows you, it allows the board vendors to make sure all the boards that are out in the channel when the processors actually do ship that they have the updated they have the updated uh, bios and firmware on them so you're not you're getting one that's been on the shelf for a while you buy a processor oh it turns out it doesn't post you have to do that right. dumb dance where you rma it or you have a friend that has another processor you can borrow so that you can update your bios you know those types of things uh that can be pretty frustrating so and to be frank like we st i still have no idea about cabby lake processors for consumers right. when they're going to be out right i know the dual core versions that are shipping in some uh like thin and light notebooks and all-in-one pcs but nothing um nothing really beyond that so clearly clearly they're coming uh to these to these motherboards uh, and it would seem the ces time frame makes the most sense yeah, I would hope, given that this is obviously going to undercut sales of uh, the current processor lineup that you can buy and build a machine with right now for a lot of right. people. Um, interesting note. Yeah, I was just kind of like, that's just unusually early. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm excited, you know, and I'm always up for downloading a, a new BIOS for my system just to see what right. else it makes better. It's probably not the smartest approach to have for a BIOS. It was funny... <laughs> uh, we were talking about, uh, we had a funny question on uh, Tech Thing this week where a viewer was like, why are USB 2.0 still a thing? Like, I get, I get, this, you know, the older motherboards. That's why the cases have them. But why are they still showing up on motherboards? And it's amazing to realize that, like, you know, you have a finite number of, you know, HSIO lanes uh, on your, your chipset from Intel. And mm -hmm. every USB 3.0 is five gigabits per second, which is basically an entire HSIO lane, which is basically either like one, you either get like a USB 3.0 or a PCIe lane and there's a finite number, which is why there's, I guess like on H1110, I think it's four uh, USB 3.0 and up to 10 USB 2.0 because the, the USB 2.0 bandwidth is just minimal by comparison. But it was funny to realize, you know, when we were, you know, it's like one more variable to think about when you're looking at your 34 motherboards that are now currently available uh, for Silver Lake from, um, from Sky, for Skylake from, uh, you know, Asus or MSI or, you know what I mean? Like that ridiculous plethora of motherboards, you know, one for every price point and configuration. It's amazing to realize how many different decisions went into that. But yeah, USB 2.0 is not going away anytime soon because it's just a finite amount of bandwidth going into the chip. And sure. it's kind of stupid to waste uh, an entire lane for yeah. a mouse. <laughs> <laughs> mouse, keyboards, you know, audio headsets. There's also some compatibility issues uh, yeah. with, like, uh, you know, getting into BIOSes and firmwares and that type of stuff. And, and yeah. just, you know, not having the complications of third-party controllers involved in it as well. <laughs> um, yeah, it, yeah. It, I think it won't be too long until we see only uh, USB 3.0 uh, and USB 3.1 on boards. Um, so hopefully we get all the compatibility issues figured out before then. That would be nice. You know what else is nice? Having a phone system that works. 
doesn't take up a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of energy. You, you know, the guy, your sysadmin has enough to do just keeping the computers running and the network clear. And that guy that keeps downloading stuff from that website, he shouldn't, he keeps wiping out. He, he should be on a Chromebook. And you, my friends, should know that this episode is brought to you by Grasshopper. Grasshopper is a virtual phone system designed for entrepreneurs, people who don't have time and don't have resources to waste, but want things to work. It works just like a traditional phone system, but requires no hardware purchase or software installation. With their iOS and Android app, callers can reach you wherever you are on your mobile phone. Grasshopper allows you to keep your existing number so you can maintain your brand. When you make a call, your client will see your Grasshopper caller ID instead of your personal phone number. It's slick that way. Simply select a toll-free or local number, record a custom greeting, add multiple extensions for your business, and you are good to go. And remember, toll-free numbers, great for marketing, and they make your business sound more professional. Set up department employee extensions with a custom call forwarding to any phone in the world. Think about it. You can have your people everywhere and still be able to call them. Get voicemails emailed to you as audio attachments. You can send and receive SMS text messages from your business number. Do yourself a favor. Join the over 250,000 Grasshopper customers today. Plans start at just $12 a month. You have a 30-day money-back guarantee. Seriously. Turn your smartphone into a business line with Grasshopper. To save $50 on your order, go to trygrasshopper.com slash twit. That's trygrasshopper.com slash twit. And we want to thank Grasshopper for their support. Indeed. I like it when phones work. Man, MacBook reviews are coming out. Uh, some of the early ones. Uh, I have a friend that bought, I think his total was $80, $89 for dongles. <laughs> <laughs> to attach everything he needed to attach to the MacBook Pro he ordered. Yeah. He was not happy. <laughs> yeah. I saw I saw a story on CNET this morning that was uh, Apple, the company that now manufactures 19 dongles and adapters. Um, now, a lot of that is going back beyond even like past lightning adapter stuff. Um, but yes, I have seen with the new MacBooks and the iPhone 7s and stuff shipping out there, you know, and now they've got the, they started shipping the, Lightning splitters, so you can both plug in headphones as well as uh, chargers and stuff the like AirPods that. The so. AirPods still not shipping, though, as far as I know. No, I don't think so. No. Yeah. An interesting conversation with a, uh, oh, Chinese supply chain sources report Apple AirPods not shipping until January 2017. There you go. That's up on 9 to 5 Mac, mm. but... Uh, mm. Yeah, I, 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 I'm very curious to see... Uh, to uh, see what that turns out to be, what's going on with the with the AirPods, because I know a lot of people who who uh, who work with high end wireless audio suggest that maybe just keeping the signal synced uh, in between each other. Uh, Apple, of course, not giving a reason for the delay, and nine to five Max says uh, the Chinese report does not elaborate on the reason for the delays. So. Yeah. So what are these reviews of the MacBooks saying? What are what are what are we thinking? Well, it's it's funny, right? Um, one of the stories that came out, uh, Business Insider was like, Schiller says MacBook Pro lacks an SD card reader because it's cumbersome. It's a cumbersome slot, best left to wireless transfers. Uh, but the 3.5 millimeter headphone jack is needed for Pro machines. Um, the uh, $1,500 uh, MacBook Pro is an expensive MacBook Air on the inside. That's uh, that's basically the sum of Ars Technica's review of the, uh, the $1,500 2016 MacBook Pro. That is the one that does not come with a touch bar. Um, right. You know, it's, uh, you know, yeah, not a... You know, in some ways, just not a, a lot of huge changes. I think the, you know, the this is kind of the simplest and, and least expensive module uh, model. Um, you know, Core mm -hmm. i5, 6360U CPU, Intel Iris 540 GPU graphics. Um, you know, the high-end one's got a 28-watt Core i5, 6067U CPU uh, with Iris 550 graphics, you know, which basically... Um, you know, the 28-watt model, uh, Ars Technica says, could run faster for longer and throttle less frequency, uh, for less frequently. Um, and the 15-watt model uh, can consume less power. It's kind of obvious, but, you know, worth noting. <laughs> um, you know, the low-end Pro has one Thunderbolt 3 controller from Intel. The high-end Pro uses two. A lot of people are complaining about uh, uh, that they're just going to be a cabled mess, which sounds a lot like when we saw the, the first of the... Uh, Mac Pro desktop tubes came out 
where we, you know, the, 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 the memes that came out where it was like, you know, a Mac pro and then 72 things attached to it by cables because, you know, it's all inside the case now. Um, it, you know, I'm really curious to see, you know, I, I want the touch books to come out or excuse me, the, the, the MacBook pros with the touch, uh, uh, um, the touch bar to come out. Right. Cause that's, that's to me the really curious one. Um, Oh, those aren't shipping yet. You know. uh, those are November, aren't they? Yeah. Right, I haven't no, seen a review November. of one yet. Well, <laughs> yeah, I haven't, I haven't know, seen any reviews. But I was of that collecting one I just these kind stories yesterday. Oh, wait, hold on. Let me check. Nope. That is, yeah, I'm pretty sure if, uh, Neither Ars Technica or The Verge has reviewed one. I don't. I, I don't want to harp on this too much because I feel like yeah. there's just a Debbie Downer on the Mac stuff sometimes. What is what could poss what could it possibly mean to have an SD card slot as cumbersome? What does that even mean? Because something sticking it's out Schiller, of the machine. It's you know it's like removing the headphone jack. It's because we know it's we know what you need and we're giving it to you. Yeah, <laughs> I, I. But even like I try to. Benefit of the doubt, like why, why only USB uh, Type C, you know, on on the machine? It's like, well, you know, they they want to start pushing those accessories. The idea of being able to plug your power cord in in any adapter in any side is kind of neat. Um, the idea that like they don't want to have a slot on the side for an SD card seems nuts to me, and especially if you're considering wow. it like a professional device where professionals are doing audio and video work. And as far as I know. The majority of cameras don't have high-speed wireless transfer built into them, despite his yeah. desire to think so, right? So, I don't know. Unless they want us all to carry a type... We, they all want us all to carry a cable to attach our camera so we can get the data off of the memory card, then chances are we don't have Type-C to whatever's on the camera yeah. cables with us. It's, it's just, you know, it's so backwards. You know, they, they, they decided they want... You know, I, I think the one port to rule them all and in the darkness bind them is kind of the goal here. I mean, the full yeah. quote that Phil Schiller gave the independent, um, cause the independent was like, why did you kill the headphone jack off the iPhone, but not the MacBook pro. And you know, the complete line was quote, these are pro machines. If it was just about headphones and it doesn't need to be there. We believe that wireless is a great solution for headphones, but many users have setups with studio monitors, amps, and other pro audio gear that do not have wireless solutions and need the 3.5 millimeter jack. I'm not entirely sure. You know, I've seen people listening to like using pro tools, uh, you know, and listening via headphone jack, but I, you know, it's, it's Apple logic. We did it our way. Deal with right. it. Um, I think is what it comes down to. Um, yeah. eh, you know, build quality seems to be outstanding. Uh, you know, everything feels good despite the fact that it's thinner. Yeah, that's, there it is. You know, USB C to USB A, Thunderbolt three, two dot, you know, um, <laughs> like so that's said, like one of the older, that's one of the original Mac Thunderbolt to gigabit ethernet yeah. adapters on the end. And then that is a type C that's Thunderbolt three to Thunderbolt two adapter in between. Yeah. And then a MagSafe to Type C adapter, I guess. Uh, Is that what I'm looking like at at the top? Adapter, maybe. No, it's an Ethernet adapter. It looks like on the bottom. No, at the, at the very top, at the yeah. top one. I think that's MagSafe to power, MagSafe right? MagSafe yeah. to, to Type C. MagSafe was one of the coolest things about Macs, in my opinion. I know a lot of people who are incredibly upset. Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, maybe I, don't, I guess I don't know. Maybe the Type C comes out just as easy, but that would suck too, um, without yeah. the magnet on it. I I don't know, but yeah, I just I don't know. You, you start to you start to wonder like who's making decisions yeah. and why at this at this point. I guess not just at this point, but in general. But yeah, I don't know. They're still really really good machines. Like they're still super high quality. I always I mean, every time I'm buying a new laptop. I am going to yeah. consider buying whatever the latest MacBook is, um, you know, and it's, I don't know, just, it's it was just interesting. It's one weird stuff. Yeah. It's interesting. Like Daring Fireballs has been collecting a lot of sort of the commentary around these, um, you know, I mean, you know, one of, he, one of the things he points out is, is you'll no longer be able to know that your charging light is on because USB-C cables don't have charging lights. You know, uh, a, a linking to another article that points out having the incredibly useful and common, you know, USB-A port 
is not a sign of failure. It's a sign of, you know, knowing that people use these still, right? You know, USB 3.0 right. is hardly dead at this point. Um, yeah. Jason Snell up on the, uh, uh, on the MacBook Pro design, you know, I, I, I put the wrong link in the show notes, um, you know, pointing out just how the 13-inch model has this huge trackpad. Mm -hmm. um, and the 15 inch model is twice the size. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's curious. Uh, and also that there is no, uh, brightness control on, on the keyboard the touch bar. No, the t there's no brightness oh. control in the touch bar, you know, oh. um, you know, it, it looks like an extension of the, you know, he says, quote, it didn't feel like I was looking at a screen, but an extension of the keyboard. That was an intentional choice on Apple's part. Unlike the display in the keyboard, the touch bar's brightness is not manually adjustable. It just varies with lighting conditions. Uh, lighting oh, conditions. Oh, oh, oh. Light okay. So. so there's brightness control for the screen on the touch bar, but there's no brightness yeah. control for the touch bar itself. Okay, I gotcha. Yeah. Mm. It's a pretty, I mean, it's a pretty slick piece of engineering, right? Because they actually designed it. Um, not to be looked at like this, but that they know people are going to be looking at it at an angle. Um, you know, uh, uh, apparently in how they coated the glass and the structure of the glass. Um, mm -hmm. You know, yeah. this display is supposed to be uh, uh, using 30% less energy than the previous model. Um, mm. You know, the... Uh, eh, we'll see. I, you know, I... I want to use one. Like, I want to use it. I want to see what they've done, but, uh, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not gonna spend $2,000 to test it. I do want to try the touch bar. I do. I like, I want to try it and see if it works as well as, you know, all the demos showed. Um, but it may be a while for me. Yeah. <laughs> if you didn't, yeah, we'll see when it arrives. Oh my goodness. What's going on with power colors, devil box. <laughs> this is like, despite the weird name, I can't decide uh, if this is awesome or awful. It's 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 an odd little device. So PowerColor is a uh, add-in card vendor that is an AMD partner. And what they built here essentially was a Thunderbolt 3-based uh, external GPU dock that has other functionality built into it as well, right? So uh, they call right. it the Devil Box. The the branding actually comes from they have uh, their highest end line of graphics cards is are, is like the Devil 13 or something like that. Um, so the, the name makes more sense if you if you know that as opposed to just coming to this for the first time. Um, it's uh, it can it can support a GPU up to I think 250 watts or higher. It uses a Thunderbolt 3 40 gigabit uh, per second connection. It does include a cable, which is nice. It's 375 dollars though, so it is it is pretty pricey. Uh, it looks like Overclockers Club tested out the effectiveness with an RX 480 in there. So 375 for the device plus 225 for the graphics card gives you like a $600 uh, uh, total purchase price. Now in theory, in theory moving forward, Thunderbolt 3 external GPU docks should be kind of mostly sort of universally accepted, right? So you'll be able to put an NVIDIA card in here, a future AMD card, whatever you want. And as long as the system you are connecting it to has the ability to support it. Um, and as far as I know, it's still in the plans for Intel and Microsoft and AMD and NVIDIA to fully support these external uh, GPU solutions. NVIDIA is behind a little bit on this. They, as far, I can't say this for sure. I, I'm, they, were, they were late to the game when the Razer uh, Core launched, which was their external uh, Thunderbolt 3 dock. Hmm. I don't know if they have enabled it yet. That's something I actually, I guess I need to, to find out. Uh, and get one of those devices in. Um, but we were talking about this last night in the podcast. You just never know, like, how many times have we thought external graphics docs were here and they were actually going to work and people were going to love them. Um, but this is what, like, adding this to a MacBook Pro, maybe, uh, if the driver's port was there, but adding this to, like, uh, an HP Spectre or something, like one of those new Cabby Lake, then ultra thin and light, uh, machines that has integrated graphics only like that is the ideal solution, right? That's the ideal companion right. to something like this. Um, I just think it's a little bit pricey for, for what it is. I think almost 400 bucks, even though you do get, you get some other, you get like, uh, external storage, USB peripherals, gigabit LAN, um, charging through that cable. Um, 
you, so you're not just getting the graphics card. I still think $375 is a lot to, to, to bite off for uh, uh, an external dock. What, what to most people feel is well, only housing to hold your graphics card and sending data back and forth to it. Whether or not that's fair, uh, we'll see. But, um, you know, if this were like $200, I think it's something that is a much more uh, addressable purchase or accessible purchase. You know, users. to put that into perspective, let me double check, but I'm pretty sure this Kensington USB-C dock uh, that Darren loaned me because uh, the Linux driver compatibility uh, is a hot mess right now. Yeah. But you're looking at, uh, you know, USB type C to your laptop, DisplayPort, HDMI, Ethernet, uh, pair of USB, 3.0 jacks in the back, headphone, microphone, USB 3 on the front. I think this is selling for 185 bucks. So, yeah, this, yeah, that's not great. Excuse me, 162 bucks. So 375 for a big, massive, you know, enclosure and the power mm -hmm. supply for the GPU um, is not sounding that awkward. It's not yeah. something I want to pay. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I'm trying to find out how much the Razer Core itself actually costs because they're, they're, only, they're only listing bundles at this point. Uh, okay. Yeah. No, the Razer Core is $399. Um, so similar, similar specs, similar feature set, similar price, it appears. If I can play Thunderbolt external desktop graphics enclosure, uh, four USB 3.0 ports, and Ethernet. Um, it, it has RGB lights built into it. So I know you're a big fan. Um, and, uh, yeah, compatible with their own laptop. Of course it lists there, but, uh, yeah, that's, that's a lot. That's colors, a lot. Man. I have all 16.4 <laughs> million colors on this keyboard individually adjustable for every single individual key. So yeah, I assure yeah. you I mock the LEDs so, because they're in my face. Yeah. The power color thing is not as overpriced as I, as I thought. Just the whole market, the whole product market is overpriced for what I think they should be at. Um, so more You're competition. I know Ace, Asus showed one at CES. I don't know if it's actually ever been released, but they showed one as well. That was USB uh, or Thunderbolt 3 as well. So let's hope. Let's hope. Power Color Devil Box does not seem to be showing up on Newegg. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me. I mean, these are these are pretty niche products, and it's it's there's a lot of compatibility issues with it, right? Like, even if you have a Thunderbolt three port, doesn't necessarily mean your laptop will support it, or your graphics, your integrated graphics will allow it to pass the the uh, display pipeline back through, right? It kind of has to be built with that in mind. Um, and I think that may be part of the reason why it's not as widespread of a feature yet. It's something Intel needed to be involved in when kind of designing platforms for it. Hopefully when, you know, Cabby Lake systems are, are widely available, that's something that's uh, uh, better addressed. Nothing wrong with being better addressed. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Something I've been looking at, I'll be talking about it on Tech Thing next week, along with Sennheiser's latest gaming headset, Logitech's Prodigy G231. Sebastian Peak gets deep. Uh, Prodigy lineup is Logitech's affordable lineup of uh, gaming gear. Uh, not a huge fan of the Prodigy labeled keyboards, which are essentially membrane keyboards with some LED action. Um, but uh, uh, you know, he was looking at how it performs in terms of audio and how comfortable they are mm. in terms of long-term wearing. Um, you know, two-channel stereo. Emulating 7.1 channel sound off of games, um, pretty decent size, like 40 millimeter, uh, 1.6 inch drivers. Like everything else, it's like 20 hertz, 20 kilohertz, which gets really exciting. You're like, it has the entire bandwidth of human hearing. Um, but you got to remember, they're not reporting like it's like how many decibels down <laughs> it is, because it may right. be like negative 15 decibels at 20 hertz, which be probably uh, not hearable compared to everything else. <laughs> music there right. um sorry it's it's a i've been looking at a lot of headphones lately and getting irritated and speakers and getting irritated by the way a lot of specs are reported by a lot of companies um you know they're pretty good the uh more expensive headphones he's tested have uh more bass um you know the mid-range which is the bulk of where you do your listening uh is pretty neutral the sound stage with sort of the idea of how big the audio sounds to your ears uh is fairly wide he said it was clear and detailed i'd agree with that um you know, 
there's no issues. Um, there's no issues with, you know, using them for music. There's no issues with using them for, uh, movie soundtracks. Um, you know, it's not, uh, uh, for the price, it's a pretty good deal. Um, I will say in general, uh, I was in a conversation with a friend of mine recently who is looking to build a gaming headset simply because he's found them all so terrible compared to any headphones uh, he sells <laughs> or he, any any sort of like <laughs> audio headphones um, you know because generally they're they're you know their 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 audio quality is not as impressive as a lot of dedicated uh, or I should say a lot of headphones that don't either a come with LEDs fold down boom mics or really really bright colors but they're selling for 70 bucks on the street which is not a bad price um take a look got an editor's choice from pc perspective and uh if you are in a headset frenzy uh check out tech thing next week i'm going to be looking at these alongside of again a, a, a much more expensive uh set of uh headphones from uh gamer uh, pc gamer headphones from uh sennheiser and hmm. a inexpensive do-it-yourself add a mic to your favorite headphones option <laughs> that comes in uh hmm, cool. incredibly cheap i like cheap cheap is good yeah. yeah so good stuff oh my goodness uh and gadget reminds us that you can now legally hack your own car or smart tv the ftc's security research exemption to the dmca has kicked in um so basically uh uh, they say researchers can now probe connected devices, computers, and cars for security vulnerabilities without li- risking a lawsuit. This is a big deal. Um, you know, uh, as we discovered in the last year, a lot of automotive uh, uh, computers, cars, vehicles are staggeringly insecure. Um, you know, when someone you can lock the brakes up on your vehicle from outside your vehicle by hacking, that's a little scary. Um You know, this is similar to legislation back in 2014 from the FTC and the U.S. Library of Congress that allowed you to unlock your own smartphone. Um, You know, but literally until what day did this go up? Uh, I think the first of November, uh, it was illegal uh, uh, to, you know, try to sort of uh, hack into, uh, you know, the programs in your car. Uh, They they note thermostats, tractors. Uh, iFix did a really amazing article talking about how, uh, you know, in, this sounds silly, right? But think about it. You've got this four hundred thousand dollar combine in a field or tractor or whatever you know implement of harvest that you prefer to think of, uh, and you know you need to get a code read to figure out what the problem is with your highly sophisticated, incredibly expensive piece of you know farm machinery, and you have a a crop in the field you're trying to harvest, but you're not allowed to access that code. And if you bypass the copy protection on, on, on the farm implement, you can be sued or, and, uh, that was a, you know, it's, it's, it is, it is really nuts. So, uh, I'm glad that they're doing this. Um, the FTC is only allowed the exemptions, uh, for two years, but, uh, yeah, there it was. Uh, John Deere told farmers that they have no right to root around in the software that runs on their tractor, even when they're just trying to fix the damn thing. So, um, <laughs> good read. Uh, this is something that the EFF, iFixit, uh, Repair.org uh, have been pushing really, really hard that research and repair should be exempted from the DMCA. So, I am excited about this uh, and wish it hadn't taken this long. Yep. So, something to think about. Oh, my goodness. Oh, by the way, Qualcomm, making money hand over fist. Uh, and Shannon has basically decided to keep her Pixel and has fundamentally abandoned her Nexus phone. Just want to lay that out there. <laughs> <laughs> no, she's, she's getting more and more enthusiastic about the Pixel by the day. I, however, am still really agitated uh, by the login for GeForce experience. So. I see. I see. In any case, a relatively mild episode of This Week in Computer Hardware because, you know, we didn't have 19 things being released simultaneously this week, which has kind of yep, been most of helps. the last two months. Uh, if you're thinking about Black Friday, you got a question for Ryan or I about what you want to start looking to get under the tree or put under other people's trees, presents, gifting, that kind of thing. Do us a favor. Tweet at Ryan Shrout or at Patrick Norton and... uh 
do yourself a favor. Keep an eye on PCPer.com and Texilla.com or AVXL.com where you will find us doing the other things we do when we're not recording this week in computer hardware. If this is your first episode of This Week in Computer Hardware. Do us a favor. Go to twit.tv slash TWICH where you will find all of the information about the show, all of the old episodes, uh, and how to subscribe and links to the offers that we talk about on the show. And uh, with that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Ryan Stroud. We'll see you next week on Twitch. Twitch.